Welcome to another episode of the Spoon Mob Podcast. This week, I am joined by chef owner BJ Lieberman of Here Eighth, which is his new restaurant here in Columbus, Ohio. But previously, we've had BJ on two times before uh, to talk about Ginger Rabbit, which was the second concept, jazz lounge and bar that they do some dinners at, and also his first concept, Chapman's Eat Market. So three concepts here in Columbus. Chapman's was the first, Ginger Rabbit the second, and now Here Eighth is the third. And he's our second third-time guest, other being Matt Hagens of Preston's and Cafe Overlook and the Bincho Boys and friends too as well. He does that dinner series over at Columbus State. Wanted to have BJ on just to talk Here Eighth. We had the chance to go to the friends and family opening and experience a little bit of what they were doing and also had a chance to go back and have kind of a proper meal experience make the reservation go. We did the chef's counter so we could kind of watch the kitchen and everything. Had a fantastic time. So the menu is structured in kind of four quadrants, kind of four different breakouts, you know, your mains, your sides, kind of your starters, and then some skewers. They rotate pretty frequently. Dishes on the menu, which is awesome to see. It's not a full overtake and we get into that and BJ elaborates on kind of why they do that and the ethos behind it and everything. But we've had a great time there. The food's delicious. It's a huge space, huge restaurant space in Short North. Live fire, big staff. I forget the exact amount of seats that they can handle because there's an upstairs bar area, upstairs private dining area and then downstairs there's a bar area your main dining area and also like a chef's counter right in front of kind of the main group of tables and everything so really really big restaurant but well done the food is delicious too so wanted to have bj back on to talk about it kind of get the word out about kind of some of the stuff behind it too as well that maybe people had missed since there was a bunch of restaurant openings last year in 2023 or stuff that uh, you know people just didn't catch or whatever so uh, they are open they have been open for a few months can make reservations. It's here eighth six one four. It's H I R A E T H is how you spell it. Six one four dot com is the website. You can follow them on Instagram. It's at here eighth underscore six one four. You can follow BJ and all the other restaurants too as well. It's just at BJ Lieberman. And you have also you know Chapman's is at Eat Chapman's and then Ginger Rabbit. Their Instagram handle is Ginger Rabbit Jazz all one word, no spaces, underscores or anything like that. Check out individual websites. They're doing a bunch of different stuff at Chapman's that BJ gets into with the menu, kind of bringing back some old favorites, doing kind of themed menus over the course of 2024 too as well. Always having performances over at Ginger Rabbit. They're going to do some dinners again too as well, which was one thing that I was really curious about because they've done a handful in the past. And I remember when he came on the podcast last time, that they didn't have a full kitchen there. So I was always curious how they executed some of those dinners and he goes into it and explains kind of the operation and everything and the challenges with it, but also the rewarding aspect of it too. Ginger Rabbit redid their ticketing system too as well. So it's not just a 90 minute window. It's kind of almost like uh, you're matched up with a performer. That's a little bit better system. You can choose your seats and stuff now too. And and they get into kind of why they did that and made that change and all the upcoming changes and development of the three restaurants. So always fun to reconnect with BJ, just have him back on the podcast to share what he's got going on and everything. So uh, we've been big fans since the beginning, since Chapman first opened in the middle of COVID doing takeout only burgers and ice cream and, and everything. And then they did the tasting menu only for a while, just because of the restricted seating. And then finally we're able to open. I mean, they didn't have a patio originally, so they got that put in, they got trees removed. Uh, you know, with Ginger Rabbit, it's they haven't had to do too many changes to Ginger Rabbit. And now with Here Eighth with the opening, which is something that they've been working on for a while and was potentially one of the original spots for Chapman's too. So, but again, follow all that stuff on Instagram, patron the restaurants and the Ginger Rabbit Jazz Bar Lounge. Also make sure to follow us on Instagram too as well at Spoon Mob, Twitter, Facebook, all that other stuff. It's Spoon Mob or Spoon Mob one, but mainly use Instagram, which is at Spoon Mob. Check out the website, spoonmob.com, links to all the episodes, contact information for everybody, Instagram handles, photos, food, wine, restaurants, all that stuff is up there on the website. There's a contact portal on the front page that you can write in questions, comments, feedback to as well. Uh, you can reach us spoonmob at yahoo.com or through Instagram DMs or through the website, and then we'll get back to you. Make sure to follow the podcast too as well. Everybody calls it follow now, not subscribe, I think. Maybe there's a couple that still use subscribe or whatever, but all the episodes are downloaded straight in your feed. Most everybody uses Apple or Spotify, but we're on all the others too. Amazon Music, Audible, Google Podcasts is eventually going to be integrated with YouTube, so that's eventually going to go away. I think the middle of 2024 was the last little update I got from them. So 
If you use Google Podcasts, you might want to think about tuition platforms. YouTube, we have a YouTube channel too as well. We put all the episodes up there. So if YouTube, the YouTube app is your preferred way that you consume podcasts, you know, we don't do any video components, but all the audio is up there for you guys to listen to through the app and everything as well. So but appreciate everybody who's listening, but without any further delay, here is another mini update episode, which turns into a full length podcast with chef owner BJ Lieberman of Hiraith and also Chapman's Eat Market and Ginger Rabbit Jazz Lounge here in Columbus, Ohio. A little over a year ago, you were on this podcast talking about Ginger Rabbit opening that second concept. First one, Chapman's, obviously. Now you opened a couple months ago, Hiraith in Short North. And so it's your third restaurant, first kind of live fire restaurant that you've had? First one that I've had for sure. But uh, I'm, you know, pretty familiar with live fire cooking. Going back to Husk in 2010, we had the big wood fired oven that I worked from time to time. And then at Rose's Luxury in DC, we had a fairly big uh, wood fired grill that we use. So definitely not completely unfamiliar with wood fire, but this is definitely a different animal than uh, either of those places. So definitely a big learning curve that we've been going through, but a fun one. So you got the grill from a place in Atlanta, right? It was like grills by Demont, Dement? Yep. Grills by Dement in Atlanta. Um, it's somebody who our chef Wesley, who you've interviewed before, um, Wes worked with them when he was in uh, Charleston. And it's someone who has a really close relationship with Sean Brock. So Sean being most of our mentors here in this restaurant group, we figured if it was good enough for him, then it was definitely good enough for us. So uh, his restaurant, Audrey, that he just built out in Nashville is mostly outfitted with uh, Grill by Dement stuff. And I mean, his kitchen, what they did with Grills by Dement is wild. They made like actual wood fired ranges. So they're building a fire underneath their stove and then the flames that come out the top is what they're actually like sauteing on and stuff and they have ovens that are wood fired it's it's quite the operation that they have there with the uh, girls by dement how complicated is that process like you haven't worked from it before but obviously wes had previous experience with kind of their equipment but how hard is it to kind of get them to like they'll custom build everything for you but you still have to like have that vision of what you want too yeah, that was actually a really fun process. Wes and I flew down to Atlanta, I guess it was about a year and a half ago now. We went to what they call their showroom, which is also their workshop. So kind of in order to see what the possibilities are, they're kind of showing you pieces that they're currently working on. Um, and one of the pieces for Sean was actually in there as well as a few other ones that had different kinds of grills built into it, yakitori's, spinning like gyro spits, on one of them. So you kind of have like the whole world is your oyster and they build everything completely custom. So you can say like, I want a similar thing to this, but we want it this way. And they'll, you know, draw it up. They don't really do AutoCAD at all. So it's just like they draw it by hand and then they say, we can do this, we can do this and they fabricate it. So it's really cool. We got to meet every single person who was going to be working on our project, the the metal fabricator, the person who was going to be like actually building the bricks into it and measuring all the bricks. It was a really awesome process. And we were probably there uh, face to face with them, Wes and I, for like two and a half hours, just looking at all the different options. And then Wes and I were sitting down just sketching out like, well, what if we had this? What if we had that? I mean, our kitchen was fairly well defined at that point. We knew we had about 10 feet for the hearth. We probably could have taken another two if we wanted, but we would pretty much purchased the um, the hoods at that point. So we knew what our kind of like diagram was for the overall footprint of it. So, you know, we that was the first time that we ever really sat down. We're like, what are we going to cook on this thing first off? Because that's going to lead to a lot of the decisions on what we want to do. And the the other cool thing about um, Girls by the Mint is everything is very mutable. So for instance, we have a smoke box that's about four feet wide. It has two doors on it and it's beautiful. It's literally held up on the hearth by like three pegs that click into these little slots. And if you want to move the smoke box, it's as simple as lifting it up, taking it off the pegs. It's so heavy. It takes two people to do it, but you can move it three feet down to like the whole thing set up like an erector set. So there's just like these, this like grid system. So we have these two foot by one foot uh, grill plates that also just kind of click into that system. So we knew roughly what we wanted to do, but the idea of it just being completely mutable was something that really made sense to us. And we've already in three months completely reorganized 
how we have it set up multiple times based on a sole menu item, based on something that we experience where we're like, uh, maybe this piece of equipment doesn't exactly work in this space for this reason. The only things that are kind of locked in place where they are is the yakitoris are in our two. So it's a 10 foot hearth. We broke it into four, two and a half foot sections. So the middle two sections, five feet is where the yakitoris are. Those are kind of locked in position. We can't do anything about that except for put bricks on top if we want to completely close it off. Um, and then the raise and lower portion of the grill, the one that actually ha- like cranks up and down, that one is on the right hand side. There's nothing we can do about that. But we always knew that, that was going to be the perfect place for that. There was no doubt the central middle of the line was definitely uh, the right place for it. So we were going in a little bit blind to the <laughs> building the the hearth from scratch. But ultimately, with it being so easy to move around, I feel like we made some good decisions with it. And then the adjustability, you're kind of adjusting heat, temperature, smoke, how much is hitting whatever item you got on and vice versa. Yeah, I mean, that's like the live fire nature of it is you're trying to do these items that are super well researched in R&D, but you're doing it on an apparatus that is literally something that needs to be tamed. Um, How a lot of farmers of like grass fed beef will say that they are grass farmers before they're beef farmers. I kind of feel like we're fire tenders before we're chefs like the the number one thing is to make sure that the fire is all correct or we can't do anything with the food so that was a pretty cool kind of way to justify what we were doing to the cooks is like look like the food isn't going to be that complicated you need to be able to grill a steak to the right temperature most people can do that with training but can you keep a fire at the correct temperature with the correct amount of smoke for an eight-hour service and know that the steak that you grill at five o'clock is going to be exactly the same as the one you do at 9 30. That's what the tricky part. When you've been working in that heat for six hours straight, are you still going to be able to tend to it and and give it the love that it needs? And that's been um probably one of the most enjoyable like teaching aspects of this whole thing. Uh I, I think we're probably at the point where we've got room that we can grow even with it. Um, I think that we're probably not utilizing every aspect of the hearth 100%, but that was kind of on purpose because we didn't want to throw too much at ourselves right in the beginning. Um, But there's a lot of stuff during the day that we can be doing to cold smoke or or dehydrate overheat and those kinds of things that we haven't really dove into yet. How long does it take to get the fire going and up to temperature? You guys open at five. Does that fire got to get started at two noon? Our prep team gets here at 7 a.m. And the first thing that they do is clean up the uh, coals from the night before, which takes about 45 minutes. And then they immediately start the fire for the day. It does heat up pretty quickly. It's not like an oven where there's 360 degrees worth of bricks that need to heat up. The bricks that are underneath the uh, hearth stay pretty warm all night. There, It's not like, um, I remember when we were at Husk, we would open the oven in the morning. It would still be at 700 degrees. It's not like that. The The bricks are warm, but they're not too hot to like touch or stand on if we need to um, clean the hoods or anything. But getting the whole thing back up to temp probably takes an hour, maybe an hour and a half. The, uh, the Yakitori definitely takes a little bit of time to come up to heat, but... Uh, we're cooking over it all day. So as soon as we get that fire going, sometimes we even cook in it overnight. We'll take all the coals and sometimes we'll put like sweet potatoes or things like that wrapped in foil down in the coals that are, you know, a low temperature, like 300 degrees. And they kind of hold that all night. So when we get in the morning, we have these like perfectly cooked potatoes that, you know, sometimes it's just something for us to R&D with. And sometimes it's something that ends up on the menu. There's a lot of cool things like that that we can do. But the fire's going pretty much all day. Um, we go through, I want to say about a ton of wood a week. With the wood, is there a certain type that you guys are using, a certain purveyor flavor-wise, or do you switch it up, different hardwood, stuff like that, depending on what flavor smoke that you want? Yeah, that's a really good question. So we started off using half white oak and half hickory, and the thought behind it was the white oak would burn hotter and the hickory would give a lot of flavor. Taking a step back, I feel like a lot of restaurants that do live fire, you walk out feeling like you just ate a campfire, like everything's just super smoky. And our goal was to have a really deft touch with the smoke specifically. So we don't really grill over the fire so much as we grill over the embers that come out. So when you come into the restaurant, and you see this wild fire that's going, you know, five feet in the air. We're not really using that as our heat source. What we're doing is we're waiting for the coals to fall out the bottom, the embers, and then raking those around. And that's what we're cooking over. It's a much cleaner burning fuel source. So the amount of smoke that's really getting on the food isn't 
that much. So we're really afraid of the hickory in the beginning. And after cooking over it for like a week and a half where we had the mix of the oak and the hickory and we're going back and forth and trying to like balance all that, we realized the hickory really wasn't giving off like a crazy amount of flavor to the food. It, it was there, but it didn't feel like you walked out of a KC barbecue joint either. So we ended up just going with hickory wood at this point. And the whole restaurant smells really nice because that's what's burning, but the food doesn't get like super perfumed with it, which is also nice. This location was like potentially one of the finalists for the original Chapman spot. I actually looked at this space for the first time about two weeks after I signed the lease for Chapman's, uh, much to the chagrin of uh, our really good friends of the wood company, because they definitely didn't know that I'd been negotiating or found another space and had kind of been waiting until we could get face to face to show me this. First time that I looked at it was about a week before the pandemic started. Um, and it was just a hole in the ground. So it was really hard to tell what it was going to be. I also had just signed the lease from Chapman. So I had no time to put any brain power towards what another project would look like. Then obviously the pandemic happened, all the cool stuff with Chapman's, all the not so cool stuff with Chapman's. <laughs> All the stuff with Chapman's happened. We were looking to do restaurant number two and also kind of at the same time looking to maybe do a bar, which we thought would be a much lighter um, lift than a whole new restaurant. So we actually talked to the wood company about um, the space that ended up becoming Ginger Rabbit and the space that ended up becoming Heraith. And we signed the leases at pretty much the exact same. Heraith was still a full on construction project and Ginger Rabbit was like a three month renovation and we were good to go. So we ended up opening Ginger Rabbit a little over, I guess, a year and a half ago at this point. And we opened Here Eighth about three plus months ago at this point. It just took a tremendous amount of time, effort, uh, everything to get Here Eighth up and going. But I think the timeline on those things actually um, lined up pretty nicely. The construction process seemed pretty smooth for the most part, was it? Or was that just like what everybody saw through, you know, Instagram? I mean, not that like there's much you can update people, but I don't feel like there was any like mention of any construction challenges, you know, throughout the process, but maybe there were. Yeah, we play those things pretty close to our vest. It's why we never really announce an opening date until much later on. It's why you'll normally see like coming in 2024 or whatever, not coming in May of 2024, because you never know. Our original plan, our original, original plan was to open in August of 22. Um, we didn't even end up breaking ground on our part of the project until September of 22. We had every problem you can think of. I mean, take yourself back a year. The number one thing people were talking about was supply chain issues. And that hit us really hard. A few things specifically stick out. Our electrical panels were super delayed and they were originally supposed to show up in December of 22. Then about three weeks before they were supposed to get here, we got an email saying they won't be here until the end of January. And we're like, okay, that that's fine. We don't, the big thing that we needed to get up and going was the air conditioning so that we could temper the space so we could get our wood floors down because the wood floors, if they were just going through the seasons would have all bowed and and everything. And then we got an email saying they won't be here until March. And I was like, well, what's saying that they'll actually be here in March? So we ended up having to go and redesign the electrical panels to something that they had as like more of a stock item because we were pretty much like, what do you have in stock? And we'll just completely redraw our electrical to meet that. So we ended up spending like $13,000 to redraw our electrical to fit the panels that they actually had in stock. And I was like, look, what? Like, I'm a doer. I'm like, what can I do to get these electrical panels? Do you need me to like fly to Texas and like go to the manufacturing plant and like pick the pieces? Like, like what do you need me to do? And they were like, literally you need to go to the cobalt mines and have them mine cobalt faster. Like that's where we are right now in, in electrical panel terms. And our GC was like, I've never seen anything like this before. Um, our, all of our refrigeration, there is one factory in America that makes this one certain part. It's like a spring or something. I can't remember exactly what it is, but like the motors that run all refrigerators can't work without this piece. And there was like a critical shortage on it. So luckily we were delayed enough to where that supply chain worked itself out, but we could have been waiting like Littleton's market. That's why they opened late is because of their refrigeration. They were waiting on this supply chain issue for a year. That construction project was like done and it was the refrigeration they couldn't do anything about. And that's kind of where we were for a long time. Um, I'm trying to think of other things that were delayed or Seating got lost in transit for like a month at one point, which also happened to us at Chap Chapman's, which was pretty funny. Um, luckily, we didn't like need it. Need it. it was actually a good thing they didn't show up because we had no place to put them. But yeah, there was a lot of those things. So we ended up opening in August and 
I think that if we had had our druthers, like once we actually got the timeline together, I think April would have been like much more advantageous for us. So we lost like four months. We were paying rent the entire time. I was paying salaries for managers the whole time. So yeah, it was a little bit of a financial and uh, timing disaster for us, but those things always kind of are until you get open. So yeah, I don't think it can go state like be stated enough how much of opening a restaurant is just like having patience what do you need so I can get this done? Like, like, what are we doing here? But how much of like patience you have to have with just managing, like you're a receiving manager almost like you're like, all right, where's this? That's lost. Okay. Can we do something else? Or are we stuck? All right. We just have to sit here and wait. Like, okay, that's awesome. What other problems do we have that I can fix? Yeah. I mean, I am not a patient person, especially when I see a problem, I really want to tackle it. Um, and that's all the construction is. And I've learned a lot about the process of of all the things like I understand electricity and plumbing and carpentry a lot more than I did in the beginning. Am I a master of any of them or would I touch an outlet? Of course not. But I at least understand the process of getting things going. So when it comes to like, I don't know, our HVAC when we went to start up, that was a whole other thing. Our HVAC has been a freaking disaster. But the day that we went to start it up so that we could get the like we had a whole timeline like we were going to get the hvac started up run it all weekend and then we were going to get all the wood floors done we had to get the wood floors done before we could do this so like this domino was going to drop a whole bunch more dominoes i was told it would take about an hour to get the entire system started up so i was like all right great i'll buy lunch for everyone like like let's come in get the ac thing started up it was supposed to be at 1 p.m and it was going to be up and running by 2 at 11 p.m when we were still on the roof trying to figure out why none of the ac units were talking to the control panel and stuff i don't know what to do like Like, let me help. Like, how can I help? Like, what do you, (laughs) what can I do? And they're like, there's nothing to do. Like, we need to basically go and rewire the entire system because somewhere a wire got clipped and we can't. I'm like, well, what if we tone them all out? And they're like, we've done that. It's like not a full break. Like, like whatever you're thinking, we've done. Like, we're professionals. And I'm like, ah, like, I just want to solve it, you know? And and that's kind of how I am about everything is like, if there's a problem, I want to solve it. And sometimes there's just no freaking solution. And, and that's the thing about construction that kills me. Cause like, I want everyone to be as invested in like finding the solution as, as I am. And sometimes it feels on the surface, like they're not, but then when you dive down into it, they're like, I just didn't tell you the 30 hours of work I put into this before bringing it to you, you know? So the name it's a Welsh term. Where does that come from? Is that part of your ancestry, heritage, or anything? Or or where did you come up with the name? According to Ancestry.com, I am 98% European Jew. So uh, Wales doesn't factor into that at all. My wife, Bronwyn's family is from Wales. It's what her name means. Uh, Bronwyn means white-breasted in Welsh, which um, I don't know if you've ever heard anyone speak Welsh. It's a very beautiful language, very sing-song. It's akin to english but definitely tough to understand if you're not uh if you're not fluent in it and we had been this is actually before chapman's before ginger rabbit we had been looking up just like cool hospitality terms kind of in different languages and specifically in welsh and this idea of hiraith um it's actually pronounced hiraith kind of came across our plate really early on and it was almost the name of chapman's but we kind of felt like it wasn't right for that but The term means kind of homesickness, but the way that I like to spin it is almost in a positive way. Like if you've ever walked into someone's house and it reminds you of like a happy memory at your grandparents' house because there's a smell or a dish or something that evokes that or the best example of it is if you've ever seen the movie Ratatouille, when the reviewer takes a bite of the Ratatouille and he all of a sudden gets like teleported back to being a child and he scrapes his knee and his mom is taking care of him. She gives him a bowl of the Ratatouille to make him feel better. That's that feeling to me. That's what here means kind of directly. So what we wanted to create with this restaurant was something that was so unique, but also familiar that it's like, oh, I feel like I'm in the Greek islands or I feel like I'm in New York in the 1970s or whatever it is that people want to like evoke out of out of what we're building here. But then even a more important part of it is to be so unique that to get that feeling of like satisfaction that that hopefully we provide is that you need to come back. We're the only place that you can kind of get that. So I thought that was a really neat concept for a restaurant. I also think that naming a restaurant a term that most people can't pronounce or don't understand was maybe not the best idea, or maybe it was. It's it's hard to say at this point, but uh, I think that 
to the average person, if you're walking on the street, like, hey, you want to go to Hirai tonight? They're going to be like, what What did you just say to me? So I've kind of said, like, however you want to pronounce it, I say Hirai, for instance, because I think that it's a more like American way to say it. And it's more easy to understand that I'm fine with it. However people want to pronounce it, that's up to them. I'm good with it. When it first gets announced that you guys are going to do this restaurant, there are like two other restaurants with live fire components that were coming online to fire in the Hilton and then Avishar's place, Agni, in the brewery district, like around the corner from Chapman's. When you first learn about those restaurants and you're already developing your restaurant, what goes through your mind at that point where you're like, all right, yeah, they're doing live fire. It's going to be completely different from what we're doing, but how far different? Like, do you go through, run through that Rolodex and just have to like, just trust your gut? Like, I know what we're doing is going to be different what they're doing and people will be able to figure it out or it's just kind of... Like, how do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, it was like a one second calculation in my head. Uh, I mean, first off, I feel like multiple restaurants opening, doing something that is viewed as different than normal restaurants is a good thing. It means that there's a trend and the trend towards cooking with live fire has been something that's been trending in America for, you know, the better part of a decade now, Um, probably a bit longer than that. But, you know, live fire cooking has been around for much longer than gas and deep fryer cooking has been. So it's definitely a more prehistoric than than the way that we cook. So I, I think that like a re- revitalization of that cooking style in restaurants was something that, you know, has always been around. Um, and then also like comparing live fire restaurants, to other live fire restaurants would be the same as just comparing every restaurant that uses a standard kitchen to cook. So you know, it was never really a thing like Avishar's food is very, very different from my food. So him cooking over a live fire and me cooking over a live fire are going to yield very, very different results. And honestly, being mentioned in the same sentence as him is always a good thing for me. So neither of us are trying to win. <laughs> it's it's a it's a healthy competition with each other, if you can call it a competition at all. I mean, we're both here to support each other. And then uh, fire in the Hilton. Um, I mean, that's a hotel restaurant. First off, which is a very different vibe, very different economy than we work in as um, small independent restaurants. But I've actually gotten to know Sebastian over the last few months and we're, uh, well, this is going to come out in January, but uh, when we're uh, recording this, I'm about to do a dinner with him in two nights for the first time that uh, it's it's going to be fun. And, you know, their kitchen is beautiful and they put a lot of love into their food and it's just different environment and a different cooking economy than we work in. But I view it as a good thing that there's multiple cool concepts opening up in Columbus. I welcome more of them. Um, I don't view it as competition. We always say the rising tide lifts all ships. And that's how I view this is the more the merrier. I don't feel like we're in competition with one another. We're here to support. We're here to make the the city a better dining uh, town. So yeah, to to answer your question, no, it never really was like, oh, darn, there's more people who thought of fire. You know, like I know, yeah, that never really crossed my mind. The layout, like the kitchen, when you look at it, it's it's pretty long and you can quickly identify when you stand in front of it, the different stations where the, obviously where the hearth is, or flames coming out of it, but where kind of you know the burners are where the cold station is all that stuff pastry station even farther down but then you guys have there's like the grill then there's like a space and there's this big long table that you have essentially the pass right was it intentional to have essentially two passes so you because when we were there you were on one end towards the grill and then wes was down at the other end so there was almost like two passes kind of operating at the same time where from where our vantage point like Somebody came, dropped off, I think it was plates for the skewers, and you just twisted them around so the so they were all the same way. The way that they handed them to you, you just swapped them around like instinctually, just because you knew the skewer would come to you this way. It's easier to just you save five milliseconds, but over the course of a night, five milliseconds becomes, you know, a minute or whatever. And then there was like another point where Wes, somebody was I don't know what they were making on the other side. But they were having trouble with, I don't know if they were get, weren't getting the right flavor, consistency or whatever. And you just see, you see Wes go around and he's just, he didn't say anything, but you could tell he just gave him this look like, let me show you something here real quick. Like the veteran, you know, move kind of thing. Just like, oh, then let me, you're going to learn something here. And I'm going to show you what to do. And so did you, was it intentional to kind of have those two almost kind of passes to ends of it? Or did that just kind of develop naturally? The kitchen is so long and there's so many dishes coming off of so many different stations that having two different expediters was always kind of part of the plan. On Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, when we're a little bit slower, 
we can pretty much run with one expediter, but we still kind of have those two stations set up where the tickets come up. The way the tickets are is they correspond to the station that they're sitting in front of. So like like you were saying, the left-hand side expo where I was the night that you were here is expediting to the fire what they're doing. And a lot of that isn't necessarily saying like you're on fire on a sweet potato a steak and a lamb. It's more like, hey, coming down the line, these are all the things that you have. And then managing like you can go ahead and put that guinea hen in the oven because we've got about 30 minutes on that. You can go ahead and start getting that lamb going. We've got a medium ribeye. You need to like rip that thing. Like, let's go. And it's kind of more of an organizational station. And then, yeah, the PETA comes off of that station and then the skewers do. So those things are a little bit more like like what we call in the industry order fire. It means like it's ordered in and I need it right now, like start it, where a lot of the other things on that station are just order in. Like you've got a, a ribeye ordered in, you've got a steak ordered in, and then kind of giving them those all-day counts because these things take 45 minutes to cook. So if they don't have their all-day correct, then then we're in trouble. West, the station that you saw, Wes, expediting is a little bit more of the saute station and that's a lot more of the order fire elements too they're in charge of a lot of the sauce work for the grill and they're in charge of like the cavatelli whatever pasta we're running um whatever sides that need to come off of that rice uh the green beans currently which are going to change here in the next week or two all those things are coming off of saute so there really is this delicate balance of the expos kind of communicating with each other and then communicating with the cooks of like when we need things, when that kitchen or when this kitchen is running smoothly, really hums. It's it's well oiled. It's really, really a beautiful thing. And Wes and I have been working together for so long. We can do a lot of nonverbal uh, communication as well. And then, you know, it's an open kitchen. It's not neither of us are yellers or screamers or any of that stuff. But you also need to develop a nonverbal style of communicating. And if something's right, then it's just a simple nod. If something's not right, it's kind of a put it down and then walk around the line and then figure it out together. Or we kind of have like this motion, which the guests can't see because it's an audio medium. But like this means a little pinch of salt. This means a little bit more of whatever was in the squeeze bottle that you put in there. A little bit more water. I'll normally be like slack it out like that. So, you know, we kind of develop our own little like sign language <laughs> with each other over time. So someone will taste me on something. I'll just kind of do that and walk away. And they know that means it needs another pinch of salt. So it, it is cool how open kitchens kind of develop their own style of communication. And, you know, we're all about teaching so we'll never let food come up that's incorrect to the guests. Well, but, you know, it's just dinner. So it's also not worth yelling and screaming about if it's something that needs to be recooked. Like we've definitely had overcooked steaks. We've definitely had burnt lamb here. Like we start over. And if we need to tell the guests it's going to be another 20 minutes, let us hook you up with another set of naan or whatever it is, then that's what we need to do. But we kind of refuse to serve food that's incorrect if we get our eyes and our, and our taste buds on it. How often is the menu... I don't want to say the menu is changing because the whole menu doesn't change. But like we were in a month and a half, two months ago, and I looked the other day, half the menu is different from when we were in just a short time ago. So like now there's beef fat potatoes, there's a lobster chowder, I think there's a build your own hand roll that's on there too, and a bunch of other stuff that's new. How often are you swapping out dishes? So our goal, and you know this from years of dining at Chapman's, we rarely do like wholesale menu changes. We won't be like, all right, our spring menu drops in two weeks. We're changing everything at that particular moment. Well, we, because that's not the way that seasons actually work. You know, things will come in a week apart from each other, three weeks apart from each other. So seasonality definitely drives that creativity a lot. Um, not being stagnant drives that creativity a lot. And then how free our cooks are to develop things drives that creativity a lot. So for here, it's specifically what our goal has been since we opened is to change one dish a week. And sometimes that'll mean legitimately one dish a week will change. And sometimes it means nothing will change for two weeks and then we'll drop two or three dishes kind of all at once, depending on on how we're doing R&D wise. So our problem right now at Here is that we have so many talented people with so many ideas that it's really been hard to edit it down to things that were like, all right, this is top priority. Like, yes, I know that you already want to replace that dish, but it just went on the menu three weeks ago and it's still in season. So like, why are we trying to, like not every guest has even had a chance to try this yet. So that's kind of been our biggest problem is like editing ourselves down. And we're about to do this dinner again. This will be, uh, <laughs> this will have already happened when this podcast comes out. But tomorrow we're doing a dinner with Jose Salazar that we're doing three dishes and six bites that we've never done before. And we've been R&Ding them for like two weeks. And every single one is so good that I'm struggling to not be like, guys, let's put this on the menu. Like, they're so good. And it's like, well, our whole menu is good. And we work so hard on everything that it's like, all right, how do we 
how do we balance that? Are we just going to like every time that we have a good idea, just like it goes on the menu, like there's ordering, there's food costs and there's all the things. There's a reason to keep a dish on a menu for a certain amount of time that if we were just going full bore on R&D all the time, we'd be <laughs> not following those those very smart tenants of uh, of cooking. So, yeah, that's kind of been our, our biggest issue is actually editing ourselves down instead of like pushing for the creativity that's happening very naturally here. So you mentioned before that, and I don't know if it's still the case, but the plan was to implement a tasting menu, I think in the downstairs bar area. Is that still the case? And if it is, then would you take, I guess, which way would you approach it if it is still the case? Would it be a tasting menu comprised of smaller portions of dishes already on the menu? Or would you do it as a completely different menu, incorporating some of these ideas that you have too many of? Yeah, that's a really uh, great question. So um, to understand that, and you've seen the space, but for anyone who hasn't, we're a split level. So we have a ground level dining room that's about 1500 square feet that has really high ceilings. They're painted blue and we have white stucco. It's something that is inspired by, um, I lived in Greece for a summer and I just really loved the, the everything was alive and everything was wind moving through things and um everything on this floor including our lights are kind of meant to sway in the breeze kind of thing so it's like a lighter than air situation upstairs is about 1500 square feet and then you go downstairs to the lower level and that's where the kitchen our downstairs bar dish area just all the main stuff it's 4500 square feet down there so it's a big basement and um it still has really high ceilings like 20 foot ceilings down there but um, a completely different vibe. Everything's black and really, really dark maroon and the lights are turned down. It's very candlelit. Definitely feels like you're walking into a situation when you go down there. So the whole idea for the downstairs in the beginning was the people who were sitting at the chef's counter where you were seated, who can oversee the kitchen, that that area was going to be tasting menu only. And then the downstairs bar that I'm not even sure you got to see because it's very tucked away. It's very, you have to almost walk through like a blind corridor to get back to it. And there's 14 seats down there and you it, it feels very speakeasy like and you have your own bartender and it's just a very well curated situation we we're going to do the tasting menu down there too so the idea was 24 seats in the restaurant we're going to be tasting menu only and the rest we're going to be a la carte um we even did one day of soft opening where we did the tasting menu only um for those people and we love the tasting menu it came out great but it occurred to me that it was taking up a ton of space and having to pick up 24 dishes at once takes up almost our entire pass. So I'm looking at it, I'm like, all right, if we're going to do an eight course tasting menu, or even a six course tasting menu times 24 dishes, we're going to have 130 plates coming up in the window, like a consistent flow of plates. I'm like, how are we going to cook for the rest of the dining room in this case? Like these guys are completely overwhelmed with just these, these tasting menu courses. So we decided to open the restaurant with just the a la carte. We've brought it up every now and again, like, hey, should we revisit the tasting menu thing? And as of right now, the answer is no. I think that we're really comfortable still growing into our skin with the a la carte menu. I think that with there being the upstairs dining option and the downstairs dining option, it starts to get really convoluted if you're like, all right, well, these seats are for this menu. These seats are for that menu. There's upstairs, there's downstairs, there's... <laughs> the bar there's the chef's counter like it's already confusing enough as it is and we're actually about to relaunch our website either today or tomorrow that makes it much 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 clearer about what it is that you're booking and what that experience is because we've had people who sit upstairs upstairs we call it the street level who sat on the street level and they're like i thought that we were going to be able to see the kitchen from here and we're like i'm, I'm sorry and like can we sit downstairs and we're like we're completely booked tonight like i'm so sorry and it's like man, I just want everyone to have a good time. Like we're trying to do all this communication to tell people what they're getting themselves into. And it's it's just really hard through a website to show people. So we've got pictures launching that's like, this is the ground level. This is the lower level. This is what your actual seat looks like. So that people know what, what they're booking with us. And we don't want it to be confusing. We want it to be hospitable. We want it to be clear. But to get back to your question, um, if we did the tasting menu, it would be completely different than the normal menu. That was the plan. It is a good place for a proving ground for dishes. A lot like how we use the private dining room at Chapman's for a long time. Cooking for 10 people, 24 people, a dish to get a proof of concept and then being like, all right, now we can unlock it for the masses. And there's a kind of cool way to do it. But inherently tasting menus are smaller portions, generally more highly curated. Our a la carte menu, as you've seen, it's, it's much larger than what Chapman's is. Like you get big cuts of meat, you get big appetizers where at Chapman's people can have three, four, five dishes 
between a few people here, it's like kind of app entree dessert kind of deal. You know, the way restaurants ran forever before the small plates movement came around. We're like basically undoing the small plates movement with this restaurant. So yeah, that's, you know, you mentioned it, but obviously things change and everything. So, but you can always incorporate that or you can expand the a la carte menu too as well, which might even make more sense versus incorporating a tasty menu. And it just becomes kind of a build your own adventure kind of thing. Yeah. And that's something we've kicked around is almost doing like a prefix kind of thing where it's like, just choose from this category, choose from this category. It's like all stuff that's on the menu, but it's like, let's just make this decision making process a little bit cleaner for you. Like, let's go here, here, here that you have choices, but like, like this is how to build a good meal here. But I think for whatever reason in Columbus, less so than in other cities I've lived, people really don't want to be told how to dine. They they want to make their own decisions. And a lot of the times they come to the same conclusion that we were trying to nudge them towards anyway. But yeah, it's just tough We're, to be hospitable and also to meet people where they are, I think it has, has been something that is a challenge, but something that, that we need to do. Here Eighth is much larger space. It's got... The upstairs bar, the private dining space, then downstairs, there's the dining room, chef's counter, the bar downstairs too. With all of that space, is that part of the reason why the dining area at Chapman's is going away behind the bookcase? It is because now you have this bigger space where you can host more people or bigger parties versus that. And then if that's not the case, what is? And then also, what is that space at Chapman's now going to become? Is that just more dining room space now? Yeah, thank you for asking me about that. Um, I'm actually really excited about this. So it's something that we've been talking about for a little while now. It's a little bit of an economical decision, but it's also a making sure that everyone, everyone, every single solitary person who comes in has a good time. And I feel like over the course of time with the private dining room, it was originally supposed to be a place where we did some of our house favorites and then a few new creative things that were, you know, in consideration to go on the menu. And kind of over the course of time, it got twisted a little bit to be a really amazing, don't get me wrong, amazing dining experience, but it was all things that were off menu. It was eight courses that were wholly original to that room. And for a period of time, we pretty much had a chef on on staff who was just solely responsible for doing the food for that room after a while, just taking a big step back and looking at the economy of the entire restaurant and where we were going and, and you know, the attention that I wanted to put into everything that we were doing, it just kind of became clear that first off, having a chef to just cater to 10 people a night didn't make a lot of sense anymore, labor costs rising, all that stuff. And then furthermore, we were only really booking the room out on the weekends and then like one or two weekdays a week it was booking out. Um, it's kind of hard. I don't know about you, but I can't get 10 friends together on a Tuesday. You know, most people are like that. So it was booking out some Tuesdays, some Wednesdays, then Thursday, Friday, Saturdays were pretty good. And I did some math on it and I was like, all right, if we took the bookcase part of it down and still had a curtain so you could make it a private room if you wanted to, how many seats would we be able to fit in here? And the answer was 14, very, very comfortably fit in that room. So I was like, all right, well, what does that do for us if we book it for one and a half times a night at, at uh, it's uh, three, two tops and two, four tops are in there. The economics of it was overwhelmingly yes, do that. Forget about the private dining room. And, and, you know, we still have the ability to use it as a private dining room. If, if somebody wanted to book it. But the other thing that I realized is if we have a whole chef who's just putting all their attention into wholly original dishes in the private dining room, what if we took that creativity back and shared that with everyone and really dove into our core menu and really put that much more love and attention into the core menu, which I've always loved our core menu. There's nothing wrong with it. Sometimes I'll eat a dish in the, in the private dining room when I'm there, like doing R and D's with the, with the guys. And I'm like, this is incredible. Like why, why do only 10 people and I get this? Like everyone should get this. And now we get to do that. There's no like, oh, this needs to be gate kept in one, in one place in the restaurant. Everybody gets that experience. And then for the rest of December, which I know that again, this is coming out after that. And then for all of January, we're actually doing whole house um, tasting menu. Um, we did a series in, I want to say October that we called behind the bookcase where we did the PDR menu for everyone. And it was really, really well received. We were like, all right, this is a cool opportunity for us to kind of restart Chapman's with our new 
seating layout and everything is to do a tasting menu for everyone. So it's going to be six courses. Uh, the December one, we're branding a few of our favorite things. And then the January one, we are calling for the people. Um, and we're calling it chapter one. What we kind of want to do with 2024 is create a complete story of the year, kind of breaking it down by month. So every month will have a little bit of a different theme to it. Um, it won't always be tasting menus. Some months we might go back to our roots of, of uh, a la carte and do a little bit more like pub fare. Some months we might um, do tasting menus with a certain country in mind. Um, we've kicked around the idea of doing a Spain dinner. Um, we've kicked around the idea of doing a, a Thai, a Northern Thai dinner. And I have a very, very good friend who owns a restaurant in Oberlin who's from um, Chiang Mai. And if we could kind of like, like capstone that Thai tasting menu with a guest chef dinner with him at the end of the month, like nothing would make me happier. So, oh, this is what I was going to say about here, which is also true for Chapman's is like, I'm the owner of all of them. And I'm the only person that anybody needs to clear anything by. And I'm always down to throw spaghetti at the wall. So like, if the guys want to do a tasting menu, totally down. I just need th to know that they're like bought into the idea of, of doing it. Like I'm not going to force them to do something that they don't want to do. And then it's the same thing at Chapman's where I'm like, what do we want to do for February? We've got ideas. It's kind of like, all right, that's the idea. How invested are you are you guys in doing this? Like, I don't want to do it if you guys are just like whatever about it. Like, let's if we're gonna do it, let's go all the way and do it. So that's my only thing. It's just like if you're gonna buy in all the way, then like let's let's go. I'm down to do whatever. I'm really excited about Chapman's this year. I think that it's a relaunch kind of 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 what it is that we've done for the last three years that have been successful and then pushing ourselves to some new levels. The new arrangement of the dining room is going to be great for us. We're actually adding three tables at the bar as well. That'll be first come first served for the rest of December and all of January. The burger will be a part of the menu, which people have been clamoring for. Um, the bar will be saved for walk-ins. So it's a tasting menu for the whole restaurant, but at the bar, if you just want to come in and get a beer and a burger, you're absolutely welcome to. It'll be a la carte there. So we're expecting to sell a ton of burgers in December and January. And then, you know, we'll reevaluate for February if we want to keep doing burgers as a part of whatever our concept is for for February, we will. If we want to take it off, it's always something that we have in our pocket. Maybe we'll just offer at the bar. We, we really don't know yet. So we're going to kind of see how this chapter goes and then uh, go on to the next chapter of, of the story of Chapman's for 2024. We're calling it a Columbus love story, Chapman's 24. The Thai menu, I think, was the first, like it was supposed to be, I think, the first tasty menu you guys were going to do way back when Chapman's opened, when you actually were able to have people sit in the restaurant. And then the Spain menu is Justin's that was supposed to happen and then got canceled because of the, basically there was like coronavirus and just running through and everybody, you guys wind up having to postpone that. It was that Christmas two years ago when, uh, what was it called? The Delta strain came out or, or Omicron. I can't even remember now, but it was like whatever the new strain that was like highly, highly contagious, our entire staff got it in one week. And it was supposed to be the week that we were going to do Justin's tasting menu and like legitimately if we even wanted to do it like we didn't have the staff like 90 percent of our staff had COVID at the exact same time it was crazy and somehow justin and i were the only two who didn't get it and we were just sitting in the restaurant getting everything vac bagged and frozen like so sad we'd worked so hard on doing all this prep for the week and we were just sitting there just the two of us just like like we brought in spanish wines we did all this stuff to do this menu and it was just like not this year buddy <laughs> like yeah so yeah we definitely want to revisit that like a little bit as a point of pride, but also as a, as like a little bit of an F you to COVID. Like we're doing the Spanish menu, damn it. <laughs> so, and I don't think too, too much has changed with Ginger Rabbit. You guys changed the ticketing system to kind of a more set time frame, I guess, for people and everything to kind of keep people moving in and out, whatnot. More specific to, I think, probably the performer versus like a time window. And you, but you guys have done some small dinners and stuff there too. But how do you guys operate the the dinners and stuff that you do there? Because there's no kitchen. Yeah, there's very very limited kitchen at uh, at Ginger Rabbit. So doing full on dinner every night wouldn't really be possible. But these highly curated dinners that we were doing once a month that I absolutely want to relaunch in 24. I just kind of need like a partner in crime because Wesley was helping me do them, and he's very busy now. So. He can't help me as much anymore, but it's actually one of the coolest things I think I've ever done in my career where we we're going to the musicians and saying, does anyone have an idea for a theme that they want to do? So, you know, one of the bands who does mostly uh, samba music was like, yeah, we really just like want to give people an overview of like what Brazilian 
jazz music, what samba really is. And, and I was like, okay, well, what about that is a story that you want to tell? What about that is something you want to educate people on? And they explained to me what they think is cool about Brazilian jazz. And I was like, awesome. I'm going to go do some research on Brazilian food. And Seth is going to do some research on Brazilian beverages. And we'll meet back in the middle. And we're like, all right, how can we tell this entire story together through music, food, and beverages? And um, that was the first one that we did. And you know, I have an extra challenge where it's like, how am I going to execute a five course menu with a very limited kitchen? We have induction burners, we have access to like the bigger toaster ovens, the ones that actually function a little bit more like, like real ovens. Um, and I have hot wells to hold things in and obviously freezer space so we can do desserts and stuff. So it's a pretty big challenge to come up with these menus, but it's been one of the joys of my career to get to do. And uh, we'll normally do two turns a night of about 40 seats. And Everybody gets a five course tasting menu with five beverages. And for each course, they normally play two songs that if we can really coordinate it, the song should have something to do with the actual food that they're eating too, or the drink. Like there's one song that, that uh, is called something about a caipirinha and we wanted to do a caipirinha for the, for the Samba night. So we did that. And then I can't exactly remember the dessert that I did. It was like a coconut flan uh, with, I think, like an almond caramel on it. This is well over a year ago. My brain is very, very broken these days. But everything like fit so nicely together. And then we did Paris 1920 with a uh, Django Reinhardt uh, uh, kind of tribute. We did uh, Japanese jazz at, with a Japanese menu and Japanese cocktails, which that one was awesome to me because I know a lot about Japanese food, but I haven't taken a ton of time to really think about why certain things exist the way that they do, especially when it comes to incorporating Western culture. And the jazz musician had a really excellent point that kind of like unlocked a whole bunch of stuff in my head. He said, you know, the cool thing about jazz is it's been going on continually since the early 1900s. There are all these like like markers in time that, you know, if you are a type of musician that, that just does Django jazz, like you just do that. That's all that you do. There's no other thing that you do. That's what you believe in. That's what you do. Or New Orleans jazz or whatever it is. And he was like, Japan all of a sudden had this curtain come down and all of this Western culture came flooding in at once and they had no real reference point to the jazz. So they just consumed it all, like 50 years worth of jazz, all as one block of things. So when you listen to Japanese jazz, they move in and out of these different styles that no one else would ever do. No one else, like it, it would be sacrilege for anyone to do it in America, but it's created this hyper-specific, really cool style. And I started thinking about that with a lot of Japanese food that has Western influence in it and the street food of Osaka and stuff like that. And I'm just like, this is really cool. Like scotch culture in, in Japan is huge. And that's something that obviously wasn't, wasn't native to to Japan. So we did a few scotch cocktails and like, it was just like this whole thing. And I was just like, this is an incredible story that we get to tell to these, you know, 80 people who get to dine here tonight. And uh, my goal for 24 for Ginger Rabbit is to do more of those dinners. Like I said, I just kind of need another chef to help me cook it because I'm not skilled or nor do I have enough time to put into those uh, that I'd like to. But there's so many more stories that we can tell through jazz, food and, and uh, beverages all together that I think um, I think it's like my favorite thing that we've ever done. <laughs> I hope that we get to do more of those. And then uh, with the ticketing system for Ginger Rabbit, it's it's really revolutionized what we do. It's a company called Turntable that is basically like Ticketmaster, but not evil for small businesses. And the guest gets to choose their seat. Each seat, you can change the ticket price. We don't do it in our venue, but a lot of venues who use tur Turntable will have the seats up by the stage be a little bit more expensive, and then the seats in the back be a little bit less. Our listening room is so small that we just leave all the tickets the same price, but we can do like $5 shows during the week and $20 shows during the weekend. It's very easy to set it all up and for people to understand what it is that they're booking. That was one of our problems using Resi is people didn't get to choose their seats. And some people do want to sit up by the stage. Some people like me do not want to sit up by the stage. So, uh, you know, sometimes we'd see people and they're like, I don't want these seats. And it's like, uh, we're totally booked. Like, what, what do you want from us? So now... People get to choose their seats. They know what they're getting into. It's really revolutionized what we do there. The musicians love it. I really love it. I rarely eat at Chapman's, and I definitely haven't had a chance to really eat it here. I will go to Ginger Rabbit like once a month and just enjoy a set just as a guest. It's it's really my favorite place. I, I love it there so much. So you previously, I think the last time we talked, you said 
after Hiraith opens, you're pushing pause. But you're not planning on opening anything anytime soon. I'm assuming that's still the case. If you're looking for a big announcement for, from me, you're not going to get one. We're not done forever, for sure, but we're definitely done for a minute. This is this has been very overwhelming from a uh, logistical standpoint and from a human resource standpoint. Um, Pam, who's our director of operations, who you should definitely talk to at some point. She's amazing. And I feel like she could have been one of the best chefs in the world if she had decided to go into the back of the house instead of the front of the house. She really, really is a spectacular, just like restaurant brain. But she's kind of my partner in all this. She's our, our front of the house director of ops. And um, her and I just feel like we're running around like crazy, just not even putting out fires, but just we need to be in all the places at once and we can't be. And it's just been a lot of chasing our own tail. So this next year for us is going to be about setting up better um, foundations for the company. And if we opened one more thing, I think we'd both stretch to the point that we'd break. We need to to set up our foundations a little bit stronger, set up our corporate office a little bit stronger, whatever that means for us. But it's definitely a situation that I somehow didn't foresee. You know, I was just like, oh, I'm a chef. I'm going to open a bunch of restaurants. Like, I didn't see that I wasn't going to really get to be a chef anymore at a certain point point in time. I hate the HR aspect of things, but it's something that's really real and something that needs a lot of attention if our people aren't happy or if we allow any toxicity to happen. So in the restaurants, things can go sideways real quick. And that's one of our core tenants is to be the most enjoyable place to work. So that takes a lot of nurturing and and caring and setting up systems and making sure that we're staying to, true to, to who we want to be. And that's been really what we've been spending more time doing than even food or service or any of that stuff. Yeah. So nothing in 2024, I can guarantee that. But hypothetically, if you were going to go fourth concept, something a little bit more casual, right? Would it be a burger spot or would you lean more of an ice cream shop? Because there's a void in the downtown market for both those. A lot of places have burger, but Preston's moved out to Clintonville. So there's no dedicated like we do burgers. We have multiple burgers aside from like your fast food places. And then ice cream, there's a void. I mean, Jenny's is a national ice cream thing now. They, they've changed a lot of what they do. You have Graders is from Cincinnati. Johnson's is, it's okay, ice cream. You know, whatever your opinion is there. So, you know, if you're going to do something like that, again, strictly hypothetical, this is not an announcement that you're going to do this or anything, but would you do like a burger thing or would you do like an ice cream shop? Because you've mentioned kind of both like, that'd be like a decent idea. Yeah, I, I do think it would be a decent idea. I think um, if we ever did anything like that, I'd probably look for two spaces side by side that could house both of them and share a kitchen or something like that. Or even, you know, just in passing, not anything even remotely serious. Um, Kevin from The Locks and I have talked about it, if and when he ever decides to expand, like maybe he could just get an extra thousand square feet. And like, maybe that could be a little Chapman's ice cream situation at night. And like, you know, we could share assets and and stuff, but nothing that's ever come to fruition. Honestly, those things seem very simple in concept, but staffing something like that, quality assurance on something like that, like we'd need pretty much a full-time chef to be a part of that type of operation. And I think that um, with us being more restaurant-driven people, I'm not saying never. I definitely wouldn't wouldn't say never. But I view a lot of problems like I think that I would need to be much, much, much more passionate about one or the other as a standalone concept than than I currently am. Like I'm very passionate about ice cream and our burger as it relates to being a part of Chapman's IP to think about doing a standalone. I think that a I would need to think that we're better than Jenny's or better than Preston's, which I'm friends with both those people. So I would never say yes to that answer. Um, and number two would have to be the, that we have the team who really wants to do it. If Justin came to me tomorrow and he was like, listen, I love working in Chapman's. It's been such a pleasure, but like my passion is really in ice cream. Then I'd say, all right, man, like we'll figure it out. But I don't think he's going to be doing that anytime soon. So here it's open Tuesday through Saturday, five to 10 reservations, technically not needed, but you should get reservations. <laughs> you should always get a reservation if you can. These days, definitely, there's walk-in availability. Tuesday through Thursday, we're definitely not filling up all the way, which is fine. We're a new restaurant. But uh, at, at some point, my hope is that we really penetrate the uh, like knowledge that we exist in Columbus. I think there's a lot of people who still don't know that, that we're here. So 
So yeah, my hope is that Tuesday through Thursday gets a little bit busier. So like you said, recommend reservations, but we are definitely always open to fill seats with walk-ins if somebody wants to cruise on by. Parking garage attached. I would say if you drive anything bigger than like a midsize SUV, like if you drive anything bigger than an Explorer or like a Telluride or something, it'll fit, but it's going to be a little bit of a challenge. Like I've seen somebody try and go in there with like an Escalade and I'm like, what are you doing? Our construction drivers parked in there all through construction. They made it in and out and they're like massive Fords, you know, it's, it's a, it's a parking garage. It's a struggle. I, I drive a Prius. So I don't care. <laughs> You're apprehensive of parking there, whatever. There's just down like one street over from Ginger Rabbit. You have uh, the garage back there off. I think um, I don't know if it's technically Buttles. It might be. Um, that's basically an open garage too, as well. You can park. There's street parking like two, three streets over. You can walk right to the restaurant too. Like there's stuff in the neighborhood. You you can find it, but you do have the garage attached there too. Bill consistently makes me laugh. How big of a deal parking is in this city like we i don't know just coming from dc it's like that was never the restaurant's responsibility to tell people where they needed to park it's like it, it's a city like uber exists cabs exist like if you want to drive like we're attached to a parking garage though this is like a no-brainer like come on down park in the parking garage like literally you don't need to step outside of the compound that we're in to get to our front door like you just walk down the sidewalk and we're right there. So yeah, I, I really hope people come down, not just, you know, from the short North, but also from all parts of Columbus and park in the parking garage, cruise on in. We've talked to them about trying to get validated parking. It's a little bit more difficult than what you would think uh, to get those things up and running. So we're hoping by at some point next year, we'll be able to do some sort of validated parking or valet. But like I said, both of those things are extremely uh, complicated to figure out much more so than I ever would have imagined. No, food's great. We've been in. The onion rings are super unique. Steak was great. All of the sides that we have. So we had like the succotash, the rice, wasn't a potato salad, but that's essentially what it is. All that stuff also like, the potato salad you didn't have to reheat, but all of it reheats the next day if you don't finish it extremely well. Like we reheated whatever we had left over and it all tasted obviously not quite as good as when you have it fresh, but it was really, really delicious even the second day, especially potato salad. That was like a brainer, obviously. So you don't have to show up to the restaurant thinking, oh, well, like I'm not going to eat all of it. Well, it, it all reheats. Most restaurant food does not reheat very well the next day. That all did very, very well. Yeah, that was definitely a consideration because we knew that we were going to do bigger portions at this restaurant. It's really set up on, and Wes hates it when I call it a steakhouse, but it really is set up on like the skeleton of the steakhouse, like good appetizers, a proper salad, bevy of different meats that can be grilled. We don't do the steakhouse thing where there's like five different cuts of beef to do, but we do have two different ones. We have the uh, the New York strip and the ribeye right now. Um, and then sides so that people can kind of order their own like a la carte thing. So it very much is set up on that backbone. But something about steakhouses that have always stuck out to me is like you never finish all your food at a steakhouse. It's like pure just glutton, gl- gluttonous enjoyment. And we kind of wanted to set up our version of that situation here. So like we're at Chapman's. We don't generally have too many leftovers. The The dishes are very well like portioned. Here we were like, we're just going to go for it. We're just going to serve a lot of everything. And if people can finish the whole meal, good for them. But like, it, they're big, like a half rack of lamb. I don't know the last time you tried eating four lamb lollipops, like it is filling. It doesn't look like a lot, but lamb is rich. So I'm really happy with the way that, that we've kind of constructed everything here. It's definitely less of an every night restaurant, I think, than Chapman's is but that's kind of the calculus of being in the short north is hopefully there's more patrons around that we kind of you know instead of the chapman's some people come once or twice a week here it's more like once or twice a month but that's part of the calculus of the whole thing i think the territory that you want to avoid is being a special occasion restaurant because that just that's a whole other thing where it's like everything has to kind of always be perfect because that's the one time a year that you might get or maybe two times a year and like it's just a really stressful environment i think if you if you become the special occasion place yeah totally and you know we want people to celebrate their special occasions with us but we also want them to be able to come every night like that's been a big tenant of chapman's from the beginning is like if you want to come in and order a bowl of pasta and have a glass of wine at the bar and get out for under 30 dollars, like you can definitely do that but we also want to give people the permission structure to have caviar have 
the big bottle of wine, like do all the things. So like at Chapman's, the tab can vary from like $30 a person to like $150 a person, depending on what it is they choose to do. So we definitely can be that celebration restaurant for people as well. And with Here Eighth, I think that it's kind of the same thing, but kind of that floor is just set a little bit higher where we want people to come here and have a good time as a community. And we play music a little bit louder here. It's a little bit more like 80s synth pop music. Like we want people to like be into the entire vibe of what we're doing here. Um, it's just a little bit of a louder, more like celebratory restaurant, but we don't want it to be the special, special place to be. We want it to just kind of be a vibe where it's like, all right, let's, you know, let's get out of Columbus for a minute and go to this thing that is wholly unique. And like, that's where the the name here comes in is if you want that experience, we're the ones who can offer it to you. At least that's the hope. We had a great time. Uh, we'll be back. Uh, you guys, like you said, change over dishes uh, pretty frequently too as well. So there's a whole bunch of new stuff on there. But some of the staples are still there. The ribeye, the whole fish that people seem to love uh, when they order that too as well. So Whole fish has definitely been our biggest seller. I think that that one will be around for a little while. I don't want anything to be so sacred on this menu that we can't take it off. Like there's certain things on the Chapman's menu that I just feel like have been on for so long that they're kind of part, they're baked into the experience at this point. And we're trying to be careful at here to not have anything on the menu that's so sacred that we can never do anything with it. So the the fried fish, I think at some point is going to be in danger of being that item, but I don't think we've gotten there yet. So that's going to be on for a little bit longer. The ribeye, the setup is probably going to change a little bit. The onion rings, it's funny that you mention them. We like them a lot. We think that they can be better. So we're probably either going to try to upgrade those or change them wholly just as another part of the set. I really think that you would dig the build your own hand roll that we have on the menu right now. It's a steak and shiitake tartare with sushi rice and fresh grated wasabi, like real wasabi. Like we have a shark skin grater and we grate it a la minute. That's actually the most expensive thing on that plate is the like four grams of wasabi that you get is. And then we have a ponzu on there that we fermented about six months ago. We're also about to roll out. Can't believe I didn't mention this until an hour into this podcast. We have been working for over a year with the Department of Health to clear us to do our own charcuterie. Um, we just got our provisional acceptance of our program so we have pigs that were our cousin jared's farm in knox county that he grew specifically for us that we turned into charcuterie that is now legal for us to sell in the restaurant so hopefully by january we'll actually have some of that charcuterie on the menu but it's hanging in our dining room right now you can see it there's uh two loins hanging and a whole bunch of uh cured sausages and stuff that johnny our um, charcuterie master Made, but we're super stoked to our knowledge, if not the only, we're one of very, very, very few restaurants that are able to do our own charcuterie the way that we have. We spent a lot of money and a lot of time to get this process approved. And it was a lot. And we're really, really, really proud of it. Yeah, that process is insane. Dan from the Hungarian Butcher told me just how lengthy it was for him, a butcher shop, to be able to do it. So I can only imagine the amount of paperwork that you had to fill out for a restaurant to be able to do it. We had to send samples of all the sausages off to get tested and then you need to resend them off again. Um, just finding someone to test them was difficult. It's uh, There's no real code or enforcement in Ohio for that. So you kind of need to take it from other places and find people who will approve you to do it. So finding all that in a way that the health department here says like, okay, we'll sign off on that was really, really hard. It was something that we had to work hand in hand with them on. And like, just another reason that I love Columbus, like our health department, they work with us on so many things. Like in DC, it was always so scary when the health department would come in, like, like, oh God, they're going to like get us. Like here, I feel like if we have a problem, we fix it. They're mostly here to keep the public safe, not to F with the restaurant. So like when we told them, like we want to do our own charcuterie program in DC, they just would have been like, no, no, you're not doing that. We're not messing with that here. They're like, all right, cool. Like let's work together and, and figure out how to do this safely for, for the guests. Like, like they, I love the health department here. They're, they're great to work with. And, um, you know, so far knock on wood, everything's been, been really good with them. We'll be back in. That's awesome to hear new stuff coming uh, at all the places. All the websites are kind of linked. Same with all the Instagram stuff um, as well. But it's here at 614 on Instagram. Let's check out the website. Reservations. You guys are open Tuesday through Saturday, 5 to 10. But yeah, it's always good catching up. 
Uh, we'll be seeing you soon at one of the locations. We haven't been to Chapman's in a while, so that's probably next on our rotation. As always, great to catch up. We'll see you soon next time we're at uh, one of the spots. Sounds good. Thanks for the chat. I appreciate it. Big thanks again, as always, to BJ for coming on the podcast and taking some time to jump on and chat about all his restaurant concepts and updates and everything that they got going on. So it's always a great time just to reconnect with him. We always kind of see him at one of the restaurants too as well, but ran into him a couple times out and about as well. But always good to just do kind of a formal thing, sit down and kind of get into some good Q&A that puts some background on kind of what they're doing and new concept that they open and everything. So people kind of get a bit better understanding on how it's not the same as the other live fire restaurants that open, you know, what makes it different and what they're going for and their vision and everything too as well. So Again, you can follow Hiraith. It's at Hiraith underscore 614. BJ's account, you can follow at BJ Lieberman. Again, also at Ginger Rabbit Jazz Lounge is the Instagram handle for that. And then at Eat Chapman's, the Chapman's handle. Keep an eye out for all of those. They're all doing different things. So they'll have different dinners and events and everything. New menu at Chapman's too as well. Kind of going into just uh, some greatest hit stuff, but also some new kind of theme menus and everything. Probably be a couple tasty menu dinners uh, that they'll do at some point this year, it sounds like, too, as well. And then always kind of new dishes rolling out at Hiraith. I mean, like I said, we went there, you know, we recorded this a couple of weeks ago, but, you know, it's probably been two months since we've been there and most of the menu is different. So they switch it up, um, put new things on, taking old stuff off that's out of season or whatever. So if there's something on there that you're intrigued about, go sooner than later because they will tweak things a little bit, but the food's delicious. The take-home aspect of it works. If you know you think you ordered too much and you want to take some home, leftovers, whatever, it worked out great for us. It was all delicious the next day too as well. So uh, make sure to follow them, check out the website, reservations, all that good stuff. Make sure to follow us on Instagram too as well. We're at Spoon Mob, uh, website spoonmob.com. Podcast is just Spoon Mob. You can search it on any podcast directory. The link tree in our Instagram bio will get you there too, as well. Any of the links when we post about new episodes, click through those. That'll get you there. Or you can just search us on the platform, whatever. A bunch of different ways to find us. We're on all the platforms. Make sure to follow, subscribe. All new episodes drop on Thursdays. We're going to be moving to a bi weekly release schedule. We're going to be taking some time off though few weeks get kind of caught up on some stuff we'll be back with some new episodes so a lot of people it seemed like this holiday break we're just kind of behind the eight ball with time and most of the restaurants take like a week or two break around this time two period as well so uh, a lot of people had other plans scheduled guest chef dinners all this stuff so it just made it real challenging to book people and even if we had people booked with rescheduling and stuff as things kind of came up so Uh, Everybody's on a break kind of right now. We're going to take a little mini break too as well. And then we'll be back with new episodes just kind of going every other Thursday. We might drop some stuff in between mini update episodes and stuff like that. So it's very possible that you could wind up still getting like three or four episodes in a month. But the plan for kind of new guests, first time guests would be every other week. But that could change, you know, down the road. But we're going to try that out for a little while. See how that works. Appreciate everybody who's been listening. If you're new, welcome. If you've been here for a while, thank you for your continued support. We did a bunch of episodes in 2023, and we average about 50 episodes over the course of the first three years of this podcast, so it's a lot of recording, a lot of editing, so shout out to Andrew for the editing that he helps with and uh, getting all that done and turned around and mixed and mastered and all that stuff. It's a lot of work behind the scenes that goes into this. You know, The recording part is the fun part, but then there's the editing, the marketing, the scheduling, the outreach, customer service aspect, uh, you know, responding to emails, outreach to potential guests, lining things up. It's at times it can be really, really <laughs> like just busy and chaotic kind of in the background. And then the kind of the final thing once it's all put together is kind of an, you know, an hour, hour and a half long episode that we try and cover as much as we can in that uh, time block. So appreciate all the guests that we've had, all the returnees, all the first time people too, as well. Amazing conversations. We always learn something from everyone as they come on. So it's been a lot of fun and looking forward to some more great guest episodes and keeping up to date with some people that have already been on the podcast too, as well as new things happen for them, new concepts or moving to a different restaurant, new projects, all this stuff. But um, yeah, appreciate everybody who's been listening. We'll talk to you guys in a few weeks.